This is a picture of the Bank of England uh, forecasts uh, from starting in about uh, the end of 2021 um, and showing how each forecast developed. Now, the forecast here, that inflation will go up to about 13%, uh, was made in July uh, before the cap on energy prices. And if we now had the forecast, goes up slightly to about 11 or maybe a little bit above. But it will then come right down again. One of the features that I want you to note is that all the forecasts, every single one of them, ends up with the forecast two years hence at being about five, 2%. And uh, it will be very interesting to see whether the Bank of England's next forecast uh, at the end of this year uh, also has a forecast going back to 2%. Now, why does the forecast of the inflation target two years hence go back, sorry, the forecast for inflation two years hence, as a generality, virtually always goes back to the target of 2%? And the answer actually is fairly simple. It is that the lags in the process mean that if you change monetary policy, and I, I'm trying to avoid getting into the question of whether monetary policy should be used by varying monetary policy or varying monetary, monetary aggregates or varying interest rates. I'm talking about forecasting and all of this. And the idea is, at any rate, I thought when I was on the NPC, that the function of the NPC, because of the lags in the system, was to vary policy using our instru instruments, which generally, admittedly, have been an interest rate part. So to set the path of interest rates, that inflation comes back to target at about two years hence. You don't want to do it quicker, because the effect on output would be much more extreme. And as long as you can get back to target reasonably surely at two years hence, then you're doing your job all right. So one of the things that uh, I wanted to do in this exercise was to see whether and how well uh, the central banks, and we looked at the Fed, the Bank of England, and the ECB. I'm only going to talk about the Bank of England because I don't have time as a generality. That they were all more or less exactly the same. I will, be, I will talk about it a bit. Um, and uh, uh, if you look at the whole period from the start of inflation targetry uh, until 2021, the outlook or the experience of the outcome seemed to be extraordinarily good. Because if you take the forecasts, the forecasts two years hence have almost always been that inflation will go back to target. And if you look at the rate of growth of actual inflation, it has actually averaged in 2%, more or less exactly, in all of our countries, except for the ECB, which had a lower target, from 1997 right through uh, to 2021. So if you look at the whole period, um, the result seems to say everything has been fine and wonderful until this last period. Now. I didn't actually really believe that myself. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was to divide up the whole period from the beginning of inflation targetry, which, remember, differed slightly between the US, uh, the UK, and Europe, into different periods. And the periods are, uh, I take four periods, the start of inflation targetry until the great financial crisis, uh, from 1997 in the UK's case until Q3 2008, to be described as the Great Moderation. Then the Great Financial Crisis, um, the start of that is fairly clearly marked as the last quarter of 2008. The end of it is not so clearly marked. It's slightly arbitrary taking the end period as Q4 2010. Then taking the period from Q1 2011 
until COVID struck as testing the effect of lower band interest rates and then the crisis and we've taken the period from the beginning of the crisis Q1 2020 until the, until the present. So the first thing I wanted to look at was how far was it generally true throughout the whole period uh, that in each period uh, the forecast two years hence was always that we would get back pretty much exactly uh, to 2%. And here are some bar charts. This is period one, the period from 1997 to 2008 three, and you can see that uh, there's some variation, not very much. Sorry, I drove too fast. Let me go back. Um, now then in period two, which is the crisis period, uh, the Monetary Policy Committee actually thought that the crisis would go on and on and on. Because you can see that the highest forecast made during this two-year period from 2008 to 2004 to 2010 to was that two years from the date of the forecast being made, the inflation rate would not come higher in their forecast than 1.5. In fact, they saw the, the slow inflation and the sort of the generally disinflationary, deflationary pressures arising from the great financial crisis is going on and on and on through to 2012 at least. Now then, in period three, starting uh, at the uh, beginning of 2011, uh, we've got some variation, but again, it's centered very clearly on two. Um, and there were periods when they did think that it was going to be lower, uh, when there was the problems of the uh, euro area and lower for longer and all that. And there were some periods of expectations it keeps on bouncing around. Um, and then period four, the crisis period. Again, in this period, they haven't assumed that inflation would remain lower for longer. They've assumed that it would go back always in two years' time to 2%. But of course, it hasn't, as that first chart actually showed. So what you've got, in fact, in this case, uh, has been that in the crisis periods, the great financial crisis um, and the COVID crisis, there has been a massive underestimate uh, by the central banks of the degree to which the economy would recover um, and be resilient. They underestimated the, the ability of policies and events to bring about a recovery and a massive underestimate, not only now, but also at the time of the great financial crisis. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what happens is that during normal periods, they have generally considerably overestimated the powers of monetary policy as evidenced through changing interest rates uh, to bring um, uh, inflation back to time. So you've got two large but short underestimates during crisis periods and two longer periods where there's been a general overestimate uh, of the ability to bring things back to target. Uh, I'm very, um, I, I understand uh, the underestimate of recovery during the crisis periods. Uh, when the crisis hit in the great financial crisis, there'd been nothing like it. Uh, really since the Great Depression. The Great Depression went on and on and on, um, and they didn't know what was going to happen. And they, they, Monetary Policy Committee then, like most of us, tend to overestimate or put far too much weight on the immediate present, and far too little weight on longer term trends. And of course, in the COVID period, they did not appreciate vaccine. Uh, let me go back to the uh, the, to this very first one. One thing that I think is enormously important is that the central banks now and many peer commentators give a huge weight to the Ukraine. The Ukraine actually struck <coughs> about there 
and look at the inflation was already rising significantly uh, before the Ukraine struck. The Ukraine has been a horrible adverse supply shock, yes, but it was not the reason why the forecasts started to go wrong about the inflation uh, in the first place. Right, now let's go back. Right, now let me just show you a bit about the forecast errors. Um, in the first period, that was the Great Moderation, 1997-2008, the only time when the forecasts were at all bad uh, was in 2006, when the forecasts were, if you go back exactly to target, and when there was a, a something of an oil price shock, and the actual inflation was considerably higher, with a divergence. I don't call it an error. The reason I never call it an error and always call it a divergence is if you're going to forecast two years hence, there's an enormous amount of time for shocks to occur which are entirely unforecastable. So the question is, if you're looking two years ahead, what can you actually do? You can't describe things as errors when you can't foresee shocks coming down the road. Um, nevertheless, uh, one of the things that you can do is that you hope that your forecast will be a reasonably close relationship to the outcome. So if you regress the outcome of the forecast, you should have a coefficient of effectively of unity, which we had. And in practice, during period one, uh, the forecasts, when I was a member of the Monetary Policy Committee, the forecasts actually were extremely good on average. Now, this is the forecasts that were made during the great financial crisis. And the forecasts were that we weren't going to go back, generally quickly, we weren't going to go back to target. They were extremely pessimistic when the thing was really bad in 2009, Q1. And look what happened. We actually, the time that the forecast was made for, uh, in 2010 to 2012, the actual was actually well above target. We, the, the, the great financial crisis, the forecasting was pretty damn poor. But nobody cared. Nobody really even noticed. Because the recovery was actually liked. And having inflation a bit higher after the great financial crisis, people just didn't really care about it. Nobody noticed that the forecasts during the great financial crisis were lousy. Then we had the, the period uh, from uh, the, the great financial crisis to COVID. And as you know, there was, this was a very disinflationary period. And it generally was not forecast. The forecast that was made in 2013 at the time of the extreme prices were that it was all going to be about two inflation. And the actual, of course, was actually about zero. So we had a continually large uh, divergence. Notice that if you regress the relationship between output and forecast, the, the, the forecast was that inflation was going to be higher than it actually was. So the coefficient of the forecast is actually 0.9 um, with a standard error such that it's not really significant. It's more, but it, it's on average, they forecast that inflation was going to be higher than it was they forecast that we were going to get back towards the inflation target, and we never did. This is exactly the same as happened for the ECB and happened for the, uh, for the Fed as well. Now, one of the things you can look at is the mean absolute divergence. You can also do the root mean squared error if you like. And the mean absolute divergence between the forecast and the output, the lower the better. Uh, this was where the Bank of England sort of believed that the situation was going to hell in the handbasket during the great financial crisis. The ECB and the Fed were much better. The Fed, um, for some reason or other, I never understood quite why, was very bad between 2003 and 2008, but otherwise was quite good. And the mean absolute divergences now are sort of out of sight compared to what they have been. And the target is the forecasts have been virtually two, the experience, depending on which measure you use, is well over six, 
so that the divergence, mean absolute divergence, has been uh, greater than 4. Now, why have we had this divergence, particularly in this latest crisis? Well, there are a number of, and I'm going to talk about four reasons. First reason is that the forecast that the central banks put out is fake news. They don't actually believe it, but they simply say we're going to get back to target because they want to persuade everybody else that we're going to get back to target. And if you believe you're going to go back to two rather than stay at about seven or eight, then you will put up your prices and your wages by less. I don't believe that it's fake news. I know, you know, too many people know about it. And the forecasting procedure in a central bank in, incorporates probably something like about 50 people who know, and each central bank is the same. The Fed is probably hundreds. If it was fake news, somebody would say, and you'd lose all credit in it. It's not fake news. They actually believe it. The second argument about why they overestimate the power of monetary policy as measured by interest rates is that interest rates don't actually have as much effect as the central bankers believe. And indeed, there was a period under the Bragdon Committee in the 1960s where at any rate in this country, people believed that interest rates were that power. I don't believe that either. I'm, the effect of interest rates on the economy have been studied time and time and time again. And I, I think if there is, I'm, I, I believe that they're as good as they could be. Now, there are two areas that I'm now going to concentrate on. The first one is expectations. Now, the models mostly assume that expectations are both rational and forward-looking. I think that's a load of nonsense. Uh, and, it's a, and why does that help? Assume that expectations are rational, and that they believe that everything's coming back to 2% and all that. Then you've only got to do a bit of restrictive work to lower the uh, output gap uh, and increase unemployment. Because after that, expectations will take over. Because if people believe that output prices are going to only be 2% over the future period, they will set their wages and prices for less than if they think it's going to be more. So as long as you are credible, and you do enough to maintain credibility. Effectively, expectations do the rest for you. <clears throat> Everything comes back to equilibrium quasi-automatically without you having to do that much. The central banks really believe, I think, in their hearts, that if you just raise interest rates from where we are to about 4%, then expectations will take over and bring you back to 2 without you having to do anything. Now, it's nonsense in my view for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that all the evidence, and I've got quite a lot in my long, longer paper, uh, is that for households and firms, expectations are not forward-looking. They tend to be backwards-looking, and they relate to salient prices such as energy, gasoline, gas, and food. And that's what you notice, and that's what you tend to, to believe, and that's what you, you tend to extrapolate forward. Uh, furthermore, the models that the central banks use take no account of bygones. The fact is that the massive increase that we have and are having and will have in prices means that the standard of living of most people is going to go down with the bank. Now, the models that the central banks use assume that nobody cares about the fact that their standard of living has fallen and wants to get it back to what it was before. So the expectational basis uh, of the way that the, system, that the models of central banks are based is, I think, wildly over-optimistic and incorrect. Now, there's a second set of reasons uh, why, the, in general, 
the central banks have overestimated the power of their policies to bring inflation back to target. And that is because they may not have taken account of some underlying disinflationary trends. And there are two versions of underlying disinflationary trends. Version number one uh, is the savings glut uh, that Ben Bernanke argued that world savings have gone up relative to investment, and they believe that that will continue. Um, and the mainstream still believes that two years from now, we're going to be not only back to 2%, but disinflationary forever. There's another version of the uh, unforeseen underlying disinflationary trend, which is the one that Manoj and I have been pushing, which is that there's been a huge surge in available labor supply over the 30 years up to 2020, and this is now going to reverse, and that there's going to be deglobalization, so there's going to be no longer cheap imports from China. Now, the question then is, if there is such alternative views about disinflationary trends, uh, you know, what evidence can you get? Well, the argument here is that if the underlying trend is that it's a demand problem, the savings glut, uh, the Bernanke, Larry Summers view, then what you should find is that the errors that are made in, underestimate, in, in, in underestimating inflation by the central banks should be matched by their underestimation of output. Because if it's a demand fall, demand shock, adverse demand shock, Output is less than you expect, and inflation is less than you expect. If it's a supply shock, it goes the other way. Inflation ought to be lower than forecast, but output should be higher than forecast. Now, one of the things that we have done in this paper that I don't think anybody else has done, unless Ricardo can tell me the opposite, is that we've looked at the correlations between the divergences between forecast and output of both the demand of both the inflation and output. And the, one of the problems is the <coughs> lags in the effect on output in the demand. And here you can see that the two crises, period two and period four, for the ECB, Fed, and the Bank of England, and this goes only up to 2022, absolutely clearly is a demand. There may have been supply shocks, but they were much less than the demand shocks. There was a negative, a, a positive relationship in both of these crisis periods. And that effectively means that the, the bankers, central bankers, under forecast both output, and, uh, both output and inflation at the same time. In contrast, during the normal periods, the ECB and the Bank of England, the correlation was strictly negative. That means in period three, it was a supply shock. In other words, it was the man of Prada and my argument that it was excess of availability of labor. Not in the Fed. The Fed could argue that it is a demand shock, but not as a generality. Um, and indeed, the Fed, there may have been a supply shock in the early period, uh, well, it's less clear for the ECB and the Bank of England. Right. I'm quite happy to leave it in there. All right. Well, thank you very much. So, so.